Okay, well, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, my name's Graham Steele. Um, I'm a senior advisor with SARE, a, a Brussels-based regulatory think tank, and it's uh, my task to moderate the um, final session um, of today. Um, obviously, the, the drawback with going last is that many of the things that we were going to talk about may already have been touched on, um, but I guess uh, we can also perhaps be a little bit more controversial as, as there's no one to, to follow after us, so everyone's volunteered to be controversial. So to encourage them to do that, perhaps if there are questions that um, you and the audience want to ask, please just indicate to me and I'll try and see you if I can. Um, and uh, if there are things that you would want to raise that aren't being raised, feel free to do that. So to get things going, um, given that we're, we're lucky to have uh, Mark here um, from the Commission, um, we thought it might be worth asking Mark to begin um, with a broad reminder of, of what the Commission hoped um, to get from the clean energy package, which obviously sits behind many of the discussions um, we've had today. We're, we're clearly not going to expect Mark to give a final answer, as, as the process is still ongoing, but perhaps just some, some broad direction of where the Commission hoped to get to. Mark. Yes, uh, thank you, Graeme. Uh, uh, that question can easily fill an hour, so I will try to narrow it down to only a few minutes um, and see if then it still uh, is a good answer to what you want me to, uh, what you want me to say. But I think that, uh, of course, if you look at uh, the package, the main headings are uh, making sure that we are on track with our energy transition towards 2030 and to 2050, integrating renewables into the system, increasing energy efficiency, while putting the consumer at the center of the system. And I think in particular if we are in a conference that talks about digitalization uh, in the energy system, it is uh, that latter that really matters. How can we organize uh, the system in such a way that we mobilize uh, the consumer's interest, the consumer's capital, if you like, so that they actually uh, get involved in the energy transition, use all the possibilities that they have in terms of investing in renewables, increasing energy efficiency, but in a way that is uh, easy for them. So not bothering them uh, with too many obligations, but make it uh, interesting, make it worthwhile, make it something that adds comfort to their lives because we're able to set up uh, you know, a vibrant internal market across borders, so more cooperation there, but also uh, because we uh, set up a vibrant market for innovative energy service. I think there was a lot of discussion about that this morning. And if I can uh, kind of you know, throw out something uh, on a personal basis, I would imagine that uh, we set the energy market on course for a system where consumers uh, perceive it like they perceive now the uh, mobile phone market. So something that they're actually willing to pay for, uh, more than 1,000 euros for the iPhone 10. Uh, I haven't heard anybody saying how happy they would be to pay uh, such an amount for an extremely good energy service, but I hope in 10 years that they will be saying, this is the latest gadget and I want to have it. So I hope that's where we put it, we put it on track to that kinds of developments with our energy package. Okay, thank you, Mark. So a clear message there of the consumer being at the center um, of the energy market going forward. So perhaps I could ask the other panel members, either based on your own experience or on what you've heard today, how close do you think we are to having the consumer at the center of this market? Who would like to start? Hmm. Martin? Um, <laughs> so I think it depends a little bit on the country. So what we heard in the morning is Estonia is at 100% smart meters. Germany is, I think, close to 0% in smart metering. Uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit more, but at the end of the day, I think there's a massive difference between different countries. Um, so I think this is one part of it. The other is clearly that we are not that much at a point where we really have these services, which to some extent could be extremely helpful to be valuable to people. So um, if your system manages to procure energy when it's cheap, um, maybe store it locally because you have an electric vehicle or mm -hmm. other things which can serve as the storage, 
then there is a lot of value. And, and to be honest, the value in um, that is far bigger than when you we look at the smart home thing. And this is one of the things in smart home which really makes sense, procuring energy when it's cheap. Um, while your fridge ordering stuff you never will eat isn't really smart. So we have one area for really, really smart homes here. And so there's a big potential, but we are a pretty long way uh, step or pretty long distance away, I would say. Jill? I mean, what strikes me regarding this uh, new era, I would say disruptive era of uh, smart grid, is that uh, we're kind of doing at the same time the innovation and the implementation. You know, and uh, if you compare it, for instance, with uh, the telecom industry, you know, they had waves of uh, different stage of innovation, uh, V1, GSM, 3G, 4G, and uh, it took like almost 50 years, you know, so it was probably much more easy to, to keep uh, the good rhythm of innovation and to integrate it. While in here, I mean, no one will really know what's the best uh, type of smart grid. You know? So I, I think that uh, um, we, we, we will really need to um, have a very good uh, radar system, meaning comparing what exists in the world, uh, putting, uh, giving some, putting some light on the best, pra best practices, and um, not only thinking of uh, hmm the consumer but having a, a long-term view and I you know what what strikes me the most is that the, the, the countries that are that are most successful in terms of uh, uh, innovation and digital are the one who are able to articulate both uh, a long-term infrastructure mm -hmm. regulation as well as a very disruptive uh, set of startup working together. Okay, thank you, Shil. Ben? Yeah, from, um, from TSO perspective, on the one hand, we have to deal with the system. I will elaborate a little bit later on and what the challenges are there, but looking at uh, the customer, is the customer already in the position to, uh, to become in the driver's seat? I think that, w that the time is now changing and at the end customers uh, step by step uh, will become in that position. Um, is that already the case? No, that's not, not true. I think in some countries, the, the small and mid-size uh, enterprises who, who uh, consume a little bit more electricity are uh, active. Um, and what is needed for that, I mean, besides many things to be done with respect to, for instance, smart metering and that kind of stuff, um, but what is also important is to have to have the right incentives for, for the customer. And that means not one-to-one -one in, in money, but at least to create a setting in which uh, 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 suppliers, service suppliers, new type of companies can take one hand the energy system, the energy model, the energy market, and can tra transform that and create products which are desired by the customers. And what we see is with, with the renewables, what we see also with, with some products that will come into the market like electrical cars, uh, solar panels and, and, and batteries that will make that someone has to help the customer because there are only a few fanatic uh, persons who will do it by themselves and program that uh, day by day but normally spoken that should be done by, by new type of services and I'm pretty sure that only these kind of things can happen if the, the, the setting is right that means that uh, the incentives are there that the right if price information is there that the right, the right uh, allocation of, of uh, who, who took what and who is paying for what, that all these things are there, and then I'm pretty sure that new type of service providers will, uh, will step up and will really help the customer and will change the total system. So therefore, yes, the, some basics are there, but the big steps still to come. Okay, and finally, David. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I like the parallel with the telecom sector. I think that's a really interesting way and in the, uh, the evolution. If you ask most people who've got mobile phones, they know how many minutes they get free, how many free texts they get each month as part of their contract. If you ask most people how long does five euros of energy actually last, not very many people know. 
So there's, there's the, we need to get into better engagement so people start understanding the value of the energy they're using and the services they're getting from the grid. Okay, thank you. So we've got, I think one of the other things that's, that's come out of the discussion today so far is that at the risk of, of stating the obvious, perhaps, this is a very complex problem that, you know, the energy sector, how it will evolve, what the future role of the TSO will be in that, which, which is really the sort of subject for this panel. But just thinking about the complex picture that, that we know is there, um, could, you, could you suggest how we might make some of these complex issues a little more simple, perhaps based on, be it telecoms or be it some of the other sectors? Who have, who have gone through the digitalization experience already. Gilles, would you like to start on that? That's the big question now. I'm, I'm not sure, but based on, I wrote a book like a year ago about digital transformation, and I did 120 interviews uh, across the globe with many players and trying to understand what works and, and what doesn't. And, and you know, surprisingly, and I, I said surprisingly because uh, I'm an entrepreneur, but I, I see the regulation as really key there. You know, it's strange because you, you feel that to, 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 to entrepreneurship requires uh, the less innovation as possible. But actually, uh, regulation also define uh, APIs, uh, usage of data, and, and so on, things like that. And it's, it could be an opportunity for disruptors uh, for entrepreneurs to get in a game you know and and if you look at uh, for instance uh, the the history of the internet in the US it's incredible how uh, I would say a military initiative uh, eventually uh, empowered uh, a lot of entrepreneur and I think it was kind of designed from the very early stage uh, to to make it happen you know, when Al Gore uh, took power in uh, 1993, he said, we're going to bring the internet to the masses. And it took them like 10 years to do it. And <coughs> you can see the result like 20 years afterward. OK, Martin? So, so I, I'd like to bring up two points. Um, you've touched the telco. And I think in the telecom industry, yes, there, there were these stepwise evolution on one hand. On the other hand, the game really became interesting when it moved from sort of single play so telephony only to trip double and or two player trip to double play and triple play where the data communication came in which led to the fact that we don't pay per call anymore it fundamentally changed the game that was where it became disruptive and then with tv as well and and i think that's potentially you know i i think for for the energy market the, problem, the situation is far more complex because there are more innovations currently going on so there are so many different innovations in that market and so many changes that, that the situation is far, I would say for the, all the players in that market is far more complex than it ever has been for the telcos. Um, the other thing you raised, and I think this is an important point, is APIs. Um, I touched the APIs this morning and API means a technical interface which allows you to access, an, access another system. So let's talk about interfaces or the APIs and these application programming interfaces or APIs allow us to to provide access. And from my perspective, um, today there was a little bit too much talk about how can I create new silos? So how can I exchange data to create new silos? Um, I personally believe, and I can at a later point also explain it more in depth, I personally believe that looking more at how can I ex access data when I need it and under whatever uh, controls, um, is the way we should look at it, uh, more than defining on how can I find a common data format to exchange data between others. If I have an API, I know how the data is exchanged and accessed. Okay. Anyone else like to come yeah, in? Just like about the, I think the, the rate of change in the energy sector at the moment is extremely fast. I think that you, and that's happening you know, more and more year on year, and TSOs are seeing that in their role. The environment of decarbonization, where there's a lot more distributed connected generation. I think that moves the TSOs to a position of market facilitation of, of services rather than just bulk transfer of energy. So I think the, the structure of the industry is migrating more to service, to fast markets, you know, reconciling in a lot shorter period of time. 
Um, so as you dispatch, you reconcile the market, opening the market up for people we don't even know exist today, te technologies we don't exist. They've got to be integrated onto the grid in some form, and the TSO has a key role, I think, in you know, delivering that. Ben? Yeah. <coughs> What I've experienced in, and also in, in some discussions with, with new entrants in, in, in the market is that um, on one hand, the, the data should be available, it should be predictable, uh, more information, more real time so that it can really uh, respond to what's going on uh, with APIs because the, the, the cost per transaction should really go down if, if you really want to use uh, uh, or give services to the customers and they have, if they have many devices, let's be honest, in the past we had only one metering value per year and now you have to deal with, with data per, per quarter or whatever you, you implement, but at least much, much more. So you have to, to come up with mechanisms and APIs which can really reduce the cost per transaction, but then uh, it's also about giving the, the market possibilities to make new kind of combinations and new kind of services you cannot imagine yourself because that will be the inno inno innovative power of, of new suppliers and they will come up with packages or by doing it by, by low transaction cost and then offering extra services to the customer compared to the energy bill today or lowering the bill or both of that. And by doing that and, and then and creating an appealing package for the customer. And that is what we see happening, not only on, I mean, the consumer market that is still to come, but what I, I see already at the sm small and mid-sized uh, enterprises, they are already in that area that they're thinking on how can service providers help the, 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 the companies to, uh, on the one hand, use less electricity and on the other hand, have a better price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The, I think that uh, the, let's say, the new business models that we're seeing somewhere appearing are those where you start defining uh, new services that don't exist, that don't necessarily are energy only or related to energy. And I think if you look at it from the consumer uh, perspective, um, what we have to make sure in the energy system is that when somebody decides to do something intelligent in his house, that it's also very easy at the same time than to uh, be, become more energy efficient or do something about renewables. If he buys an electric car and says, I want a, a, a very good mobility service, that you directly can say, okay, but then for me, if I have your contract, your contact, and your interest, then it's very easy to connect a few other things you already have in your house. So I think the, the interoperability at the basis, so within a home, in terms of the language between all these different things, has to be very easy because if the transaction costs are high there, then you never get uh, the consumer on board. And so it's, uh, that, that is one side, I think, of the, of the regulation that can really incentivize uh, new business models. And I think on the other hand, we absolutely need uh, the network operators on board, the, both the TSOs and the DSOs, because uh, let's say giving value to flexibility in the wholesale market is one thing, but you will, uh, there is a lot of flexibility or a lot of value of flexibility <coughs> in the balancing market. Probably the more and more decentralized generation we get and electric cars and I don't know what, also a lot more uh, value will be in the flexibility related to congestion management and zero services. So, but if uh, network operators don't organize a market where those things have a value, then it's going to be uh, put on, uh, basically it's going to be transformed into copper and be put on everybody. And I think that is something where, uh, where the regulation has to play a role. And that's why we're uh, in the package putting so much emphasis on creating markets for uh, grid services that uh, as uh, um, uh, Frauke said in the last panel, you cannot have them exclusively contracted for one, pers for one purpose. You have to create a market where all of these values can be discovered and so that new service providers come in and can say, okay, I'm going to optimize a home or a customer or a set of assets that I have according to where I can find most value. And all that, the, 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 let's say the digital infrastructure under it, uh, the interoperability is crucial. Martin? Yeah, so I, I want to have the battery of my new vehicle fully loaded when my schedule says, the next day I have a longer distance to drive, for instance. So that would be where all the services come together. And then yeah. it might procure at a other different price than when my schedule says the next day you don't drive around a lot. So, so maybe these are things just as example. But to come to the regulations, um, 
I think that there's, an, there's an interesting example currently from the EU where the EU, EU did an extremely good job in a reg regulation from my perspective. Not everyone in the market believes they did a good job, but I, I believe it from my perspective, which is the uh, revised payment services directive, which in one of the parts says that the traditional financial institutions, the banks in particular, must open or must provide interfaces for third parties, the third party providers. So they are obliged to provide interfaces for, in that case, for two use cases. One is access to the account information, the other is initiation of payments, which allows other players, for instance, to say, I create the one service which gives access to all the accounts across all the banks. Um, for sure, a bank also can become the third party to other banks. So it allows them to stay in the field while it also enables others to enter the market. And I think this is a, this is a perfect example. And the target of the EU Commission was to foster competition, to create new services, to drive innovation. This is a very good example. And I think in the regulatory space, um, that might be sort of a, not really a blueprint, but something which is a, has some interesting principles in also for regulation in the energy market. Focus on the interfaces to drive innovation. Mm. So it's quite interesting that, that I, I guess, if I, if I can put it this way, perhaps the, 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 the two non-energy industry people in the panel have raised this subject of, of regulation. Um, so perhaps we could explore that a little bit further. So, so what, what in a practical sense um, do you think is missing from, from the current regulatory framework? And I, I mean that in the, in the broadest possible sense, not, not so much in detail. It's, it's perhaps a little bit around, we've had a number of comments made about the incentive is, is actually to, to put you know, copper in the ground or copper in the air when it needs to be totally turned upside down. So perhaps I could, could start with, with David and Ben on, on that question, and, and then we can ask the rest of the panel to come in as well. Okay. I think because of the history of the industry, it's a very capital intensive industry. Um, so for regulation, it's easy to target on the capital base and get a rate return based on capital. As we move forward, that, that's actually less relevant to um, what the customers are trying to get out of the, the system. Um, I'm quite fortunate in the UK because Ofgem has, has done quite a lot in innovation in their regulation, looking at how you innovate, how you improve customer outcomes rather than just purely focusing on the capital element. So I think we need to move into a world where the regulators recognize service provision, they recognize performance, uh, quality of supply, continuity of supply, in addition to just um, looking at the, the capital rate of return. So I think regulators need to push, because one of my concerns is if you try and do this top down from regulation, TSO, DSO, down to the customer, it's actually holding the sector back and somebody's going to come in that's going to disrupt the whole sector by just doing something completely different, which will negate a lot of the current rules which are there for good reason. Thanks, Ben. Uh, first of all, I agree with what already is uh, said, uh, and, and that is, I mean, to be honest, the regulations normally is, 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 is trying to solve the problem of the past. And not too often regulations is, is looking forward and creating the, the right environment and the right setting in which the new things can be developed and, and, are, and also stimulated. So the regulatory environment really should recognize what's needed for that. That means that services also should be recognized and that there is earnings allowed on, on, on that one. Also on, on research and, and innovation are important topics. And these days it is too often that the regulators uh, just uh, punish any, any DSO, TSO who is doing that kind of work. So that is really the wrong signal. Um, and it should also be uh, addressing uh, the way the customers can uh, and the suppliers can deal with it. But also we, in that area we see that a lot of um, uh, uh, regulations is on, on, on stability of the, of the system, but we need to create flexibility in, in the system. And that is not sufficiently recognized in, in, all, uh, in order to have some experiments in, in the market, how that could be developed. And then finally, also, yeah, if, if the assets are uh, remunerated, why not uh, also if we use other flexibility uh, provisions for that, you should not be uh, punished uh, for that if you do it in, in, in a smarter way. So there is some room to, uh, mm. to improve on that one. Yeah. Anything you'd want to add, Jim? Uh, again, it's, it's difficult to 
to condemn uh, future initiatives because uh, you always tempted to look on the past and not try to um, to create something for the future. But I believe that uh, uh, we have to acknowledge that, that there is a complete new paradigm uh, which is very much based on disruptive innovation. So I would say that uh, we need to, to ensure that there is a I would say a, a bottom service, you know, which is uh, properly working, probably based on traditional utilities, uh, but also to make sure that, that we can um, probably develop different initiatives around innovation. Uh, it's, um, I, I was very, very much surprised on the, the way the Chinese are trying to push uh, their smart grid. You know, they are, Obviously, a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, very basic and, and sometimes dirty uh, energy uh, uh, suppliers. But at the same time, they are trying a lot of different things in, in the, the smart grid field. And they are doing it at a certain level of size, which makes that if something works, they can replicate quite quickly in other field. You know, so I, I was interested in the, especially what's doing in the, the very western north of China. And uh, it's not the most uh, wealthy uh, area. And, and nonetheless, they are doing things that uh, are basically not happening in here. And the way they did it is by looking at, uh, I would say, a small size. Uh, to be able to assess it quite quickly and to scale it up when it works. And they've been doing it for like the past 10 years with pretty good results. And now they are exporting the technology uh, in Africa, mostly with the, the support of Huawei. But it's something that we don't, I'm not sh even sure, I don't even know if, if someone in here is aware of that. Anyone like to come in on that? How do we, how do we learn from some of those experiences? I mean clearly quite a different system to some extent. It's got a, got a huge grid system operator. Is, is that the, the end target, that we need to have more consolidation among European TSOs here? Um, I think that in Europe we have different solutions uh, for that. I mean, uh, yeah, unless the European uh, Commission is uh, succeeding in, in creating one country in Europe, but as long as that is not the case, I think uh, um, it's not about consolidating TSOs, but it is about consolidating and harmonizing the rules and the things we would, uh, would like to apply. By, by doing that, you give the opportunity that solutions that, that works in one uh, area can be expanded to a bigger area without having too much uh, investments or adjustments uh, for that. If we can achieve that in, in, in the coming decades, then I think also in Europe can, uh, can, it, uh, can be the front runners in implementing the renewables. And I think that with, with the third package, which we are now, I mean, the last part of legislation is now uh, uh, finalized with the network codes. And if that really comes into f active uh, uh, work in, in the coming years, together with the clean energy package, which is ahead of us, I think a lot of harmonization will be, will be done in Europe. There are still some areas to be done, but by doing that, also Europe could become one big area in which more or less the same models could be applied. David, yeah. do you want to add anything there? Just, just one comment on that. Um, this is going to strange, strange, strange from a technology vendor. It's qu quite often not about the technology. It's about the social factors. And the fact that it's happening in China doesn't surprise me because obviously it's a different social context. So you get the pull from communities. You get the pull from individuals, from um, Smith cities, towns. And they will actually pull through the change. So it isn't actually a technology push saying you have to do it this way. It's a social influence pulling through. Yep. And I think we'll see a lot more of that across Europe as different communities get engaged with the energy sector. Okay. Martin, did you want to have a minute? Yeah, maybe coming a little back to the regulator point, I, I like you, your comment. And I think the, the, the challenge clearly is, um, so we, we perceive regulators really as something negative. Um, when I look at the role that you took in the past of PSD2, GDPR, it's probably more a fosterer than a regulator in to some sense. So it's or a mix between if you look at GDPR where it's on one hand regulating, on the other hand using it to, to, to drive innovation. Now, honestly, I don't want to be in your role 
um, and the role of your colleagues uh, when it comes to regulations in the energy sector because there are so many contradictory requirements. On the one hand, we need a backbones, whatever wind in the north of Germany, production in the south of Germany. On the other hand, we have the decentralization, uh, small, more autonomous or grids, islanding, etc. Uh, we have to, to, to keep some companies uh, up and running in Germany, we have the deconstruction of nuclear plants where someone still has to pay for. So it's a very complex field where it's not easy to, to find that balance uh, between how can you enable it. But I think I take your point, um, something which ends up in inhibiting uh, innovation um, too much and saying you are not allowed to do that, uh, probably is, from my outside perspective, um, not the right way to proceed. More? Yeah, uh, I have a great job, so uh, yeah. you can envy me actually, because uh, it's really very, very nice, and it actually makes it interesting the fact that you have to take all these different things into account, and for example, you have to start from the structure we have, uh, with uh, 28 member states, 28 different systems, with 28 different origins, uh, and see how you can slowly build that into one, uh, instead of just uh, telling the whole of the EU, how it's going to be, like they maybe uh, do somewhere else. But the, uh, the so the, the changing those structure uh, takes, it takes time. Eh? That's why we are now a clean energy package, which is the fourth pack of legislation. But it's also, of course, a consequence of the fact that the structure of the industry is changing. And we're talking a lot about digitalization now. But I also think that the digitalization kind of comes at the right time as we are decentralizing anyway because the solar panels and the windmills have become so cheap so the uh, it in a way it goes very nicely hand in hand that all this uh, decentralization is happening at the same time we get all the tools to be able to control it better um, I think that uh, indeed we need to change the way in which uh, network operators are rewarded to some extent I don't want to underestimate the role of regulators and the difficult balance they have to make and we can say that we have a difficult job, but I think if you're in the regulator's shoes, you basically have us on your neck and the network operators and the national politicians and everybody else who wants cheap energy, so they may even have a harder job. And finding a balance between allowing experimental investments, uh, allowing smart investments that you don't know whether they're really going to be smart because you just have to rely on what the network operator tells you and then guarantee the interest of the citizens is very difficult. But uh, I think where, there, where we are uh, seeing a consensus is that we have to go away from just rewarding investment in copper and rewarding much more investments in things like uh, ASTFEED, for example, uh, what, we, what we just mm -hmm. heard about. Platforms, uh, digital technologies, creating markets uh, as a way to optimize the way, uh, the way the grid is managed. And uh, um, of course, with the, uh, the research budget we have in the, at the EU level, but also at national level, we try to support that um, and we heard of this uh, let's say earlier in the previous panels also that there is a lot of need for testing and piloting and then some say maybe not so much piloting but actually doing things uh, I would like to think that it's a bit in between on the one hand uh, I think what we don't need is to test one solution in one place and test it then the same solution in another place and I think we've, we've had enough tests of seeing whether a solar panel can actually contribute to let's say, uh, voltage control or balancing or things like that, uh, or, or battery in another place. I think what we now need is to really show at a systemic level how this can work, how you can use the same asset for balancing, for congestion management, and a consumer still for his own comfort and maybe f to get a bit of return in the wholesale market, so to trade with it as well. How do all these different things work together for different assets at the same time? Technically, it can all work, but uh, when, when we talk about, you know, we start from something, we have an existing situation, it also means bringing uh, the, the, the structures of the industry along and, and gradually changing and having a faith in, in, in the fact that such solutions can work and that they also uh, can be implemented at a big, uh, at a, let's say, at a systemic level, so big in size, um, without endangering a security supply. And I think it's not a matter of technology there, but it's really a matter of how you operate and then how, a, uh, we man that was mentioned before, how a TSO cooperates with a DSO in a way that makes it easy for an aggregator to actually do something useful with all that. And I think that's, for me, a very good discussion of 
the whole day was really about that. How do we make all these different parts of the system work together? I think what maybe we need to do a bit more is look at it from the consumer perspective, who will not look at this energy silo, but will look at, you know, I want to have a smart home who can give me some comfort and a lower price or some nice goodies. And w how can we facilitate that? Okay, Ben. Uh, maybe also to facilitate that, I think, and that is at least also what I try to, to discuss among the TSOs, is that in itself we could give a, a kickstart in, in some of these processes. Um, on the one hand, we, we, we are responsible and we feel utmost responsible for keeping the lights on and the, the security of supply, uh, because we don't want to, uh, to, to lower the, the quality of, of the security of supply. On the other hand, we are the biggest I think one of the biggest uh, procurers of, of uh, energy and also ancillary services. And we, we should really think about also as TSOs how in the past we were used to buy that kind of services from big power plants. But they are disappearing, uh, or at least not needed all the time when the, solar, the sun is there and when the wind is there. That makes it also we have to, to update and to refine and redefine our products with, which we are uh, buying from the market in order to make it possible to have kind of pooling products. And by doing that, by pooling products, that ca that's now possible with the digitalization, now things come together. But by, by changing our product specifications, and we do that step by step, because we are conservative, we want to keep the lights on, but nevertheless, the volume is that significant that the, the new service providers will really look carefully to that and based on that come with new services and then combine it with other capabilities like how to deal with electrical cars what can they do and then suddenly it's not only a, a, and the heat pumps and the air conditioning and then the things really come together the heat system the electricity system and the transport system and we can as tsos and we have to do that by maintaining the, the security of supply but step by step procuring these products in with, with adjusted uh, product specifications in order to make these kind of uh, things happen. Okay. So just, just picking up on, we've, we've talked a couple of times there about the impact we think, for example, electric vehicles might have. How long, how long do you all feel the energy sector, and perhaps specifically the TSOs, as that's what we're talking about in this panel, how long do you think um, we've got before, you know, other other uh, other sectors will perhaps disrupt so much that that they're setting the agenda in the sense of I'm, I'm thinking about you know, some political statements about increasing the speed of the rollout of electric vehicles, perhaps way beyond what what has previously been thought about. How much time do we think we, we have here? G you can't say. I mean. It would be great if we could say, but the, probably what is very unique to disruptive innovation is that it's not predictable. You can't say when it's going to come. The only thing you have to know is that the potential of the digitalization is probably higher than anything we can expect. And uh, it, it might be one of the best way to answer to the global warming challenge. Uh, and, and, and the last thing, I think, which three things, yeah. The, the importance of uh, the digitalization, uh, the fact that you, you really can't predict when it's going to happen, and uh, the fact that uh, uh, global warming and digitalization goes together. You know, so that makes, uh, at the end of the day, I believe that you know, we are probably heading towards something which is the highest challenge the humanity never faced. And, uh, with incremental innovation, we won't make it at all. It's, it's sure, every scientist agree with that. So we need to go for very disrupt, disruptive innovation. And I think that having a, what you just said, a holistic approach uh, is also part of disruptive innovation. You know, not saying I'm in the energy field, in the electricity field, and I need to stick to it, but being able to be cross energy, cross huge edge, uh, cross storage, whatever, you know, to think disruptive. And at some point, you're going to have a solution that will look and be actually far better than the other and that will replicate uh, all across Europe and maybe the rest of the world, like we did with uh, GSM. Okay. 
Martin and then yeah. David. I, I want to bring up two points here. The one is this discussion, or also the question maybe, it has a little bit the, the perspective or the notion of, oh, there will be others which drive the established players out of business. Um, I, I doubt that it's that easy. Um, and if I look at the tycos, probably all of the large tycos are pretty well in their business in Europe. So when you go back to the Trump Telecom and many others, because at the end they, they own some, not only intellectual property, but also some technology like the cables, uh, which are not that easy to replace by, by someone. So there, there, there will be a role, and, and some of them really then became innovative. And um, So I think maybe it's good to look at it also more from an opportunity perspective. Not, so it was a little maybe defensive the last minutes. Um, there's also opportunity to probably broaden what the utility industry does um, due to their access to the consumers, etc. And, and maybe it's also worse to look at it from, from that perspective. The other point I found interesting, it's a news I read today, which was from Norway, where I think the, the national um, uh, whatever um, institution it is, which is responsible for the energy market, warned uh, uh, so to speak, one for, uh, of the use of electric vehicles. Uh, they have a very high rate of electric vehicles and they are increasingly experiencing challenges in smaller villages uh, because the number of electric consumption by vehicles compared to what they can supply there uh, doesn't fit anymore. So that's the other side of things. So I think there's still a massive need also to expand things which only the established parties can do. If they then use the opportunity and combine it with getting better and, and, or and closer to the customer, broader in the service, um, then, then I think there's also a positive side of it. Yeah, uh, David, and then we'll bring in Ben. Yes, yeah, sorry, Ben. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, we, I think you'll be careful you don't consider the energy sector in isolation. Um, automotive and what's coming along with electric vehicles. If you connect electric vehicles as a dumb device to the network, it causes a problem. If it's connected as a manageable resource, using data, using a lot of analytics, then you can do a lot more with it. So I think as the energy sector, and as we move towards the electrification of everything, which is where we seem to be going, we need to engage wider than just energy. We start to need to look at transportation, you know, healthcare and all these other things, heating, all the things that will spin out of electrification of everything. Um, yeah, coming back to your question, when will it, uh, will it happen? And I think it can happen uh, every day because some products are in place and in, uh, in my, my company we are already buying frequency containment reserves from a company who installs and uh, operates uh, uh, charging poles. And they are selling the product to us uh, scattered throughout the Netherlands. I mean, volume is is still moderate, but it, it makes the difference. They, they come, came to us and said, we want to do something with electrical cars. We can control them. Can we make, a, can we, uh, make somewhere a deal and find each other? And these kind of things, we did a test and it worked fine. And now they, are, they became a supplier for, for that product. Now we are in another setting with, with blockchain techniques, also digitalization, because the, 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 the transaction cost should be really low, uh, these kind of things. How can they make offers to us for automated uh, frequency restoration reserves? These kind of things can happen. And if there are some good examples in Europe, I'm pretty sure that will be picked up by, by new companies to address that. So your question, when will it happen? Hopefully sooner than, uh, than later. Okay. One of the other points that Mark raised a little bit earlier was, was, was I guess, the use of some of the research and development opportunities um, within um, the sort of EC's overall, overall package. Have you any thoughts about, about, perhaps you could start, Mark, with, do you think that could be used more? Is the Commission looking for more innovation ideas to come through that? Or? Um, well, uh, let's say in our internal commission discussions when we talk about do we need money for energy research or do we need money for uh, I don't know, transport research or for health research, of course, we always say that we need more. Um, I think that, uh, but I think that the, in general, the budget that the EU has 
uh, at, so at the commission level, let's say, to, uh, to invest in, in research in energy is uh, a, a serious chunk because overall it's something like 20% of the total public uh, expenditure in R&D and energy in Europe. So it's really a, a considerable amount. Um, and what, uh, what I said is what I hope we're going to do and we're going to facilitate with the next work program that will come out now somewhere uh, end of October uh, is really support these kind of systemic tests. And so not pockets of uh, you know, testing a battery here and a solar panel there, but test how all these things fit together. Because technology-wise, I think we, we've proven that it can work, but how does it work if you do it at a systemic level? And there, uh, I think one of the key issues is also make, uh, make sure that we so the select the right project, huh? but that's up to us writing good uh, calls, up to the industry coming with good proposals, but so far I don't think we have anything to complain there. As a matter of fact, we're usually not able to fund everything we would like to fund. But uh, I think one thing where we can do better, uh, not just us, but also together with the, the, the regulators and the industry, is make sure that when we have a good project, and when we have tested something that works, that we implement it much more rapidly elsewhere. And I think that's probably a European problem in many ways. We talk about a lot about how in the US they're much better at picking up good ideas and uh, financing them with some business angels and bringing it to a market. I think in the grid, uh, it's maybe uh, a bit more difficult than that because it's a regulated business. So you need the network operators on board. You need the regulators on board to be able to recognize the good ideas and to say, okay, we believe we've seen how this works. We understand it, so we don't need everybody else to come to us and ask to test it in a small community, but they can roll it out straight away. And I think that's still where we have, uh, where I hope we can make some uh, big steps in the, in the coming years. Anyone else want to come in on this question? I, I think it's, it's not only a matter of uh, investment, uh, it's also, I don't want to, to say that what would do the American or the Chinese is better, but uh, at least in terms of um, pushing small-scale innovation, I, I believe that's very good at it. You know, the, the, for instance, if you look at the DARPA, which is um, a military agency, they are financing some challenges, uh, like six months, one year, one million, five million, and they have been able to bring a lot of uh, disruptive innovation. Uh, even in the energy field. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I think, you know, we can't uh, say that disruptive innovation is an option because we are all connected, because you can find any type of resources online. Uh, it's becoming much more easy to connect things, people, uh, concepts, innovation, and at the end of the day, to do things that you couldn't do before you know, like uh, using cars as energy suppliers, things like that. You need to have a lot of intelligence to that, a lot of data, actually. And um, so we need to change the, the way we conceive uh, innovation from incremental R&D to disruptive innovation. And, and we need, I mean, it's, 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 it's not just technical, it's political. It has to be uh, not only something that people from the labs understand, but politicians do as well. You know, because if you look at uh, what's happening outside of Europe, I think that pretty much a lot of their success is coming from this type of, of mindsets. So I think, obviously, we need to have investment in several fields in everywhere. We need money everywhere, actually, as you know. Uh, but I think more of, I would say, an, an innovation doctrine and a way to decide on uh, what to scale up and what not to scale up. Okay, so it doesn't sound like money is the problem anyway, which is always, always a good start. Um, so, based on what we've just talked about, what, what, do we think, what do we think the sort of TSO of the future looks like? Is it, is it totally different from... from the model we see today, when David talked a little bit earlier about you know, the, 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 the historic concept being one of, 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 of assets and you know, assets that you can sort of feel and touch, how do we think that's going to change and, and how big a change will it be? Ben? 
Um, now, first, I think the assets still will remain uh, because, yeah, to transport electricity uh, through the air, that's still a, a challenge. Uh, so, therefore, still we need somewhere uh, some copper uh, in wires. Um, so, assets will remain important, and also for more, if we, we introduce more renewables and to have transport of, of uh, uh, electricity from from wind areas to, uh, to uh, urban areas, then still you need uh, uh, the capabilities of, 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 of a an, an high voltage grid for that. On the other hand, uh, in that area, the, the TSO will change for the transmission part to use more digitalization for all kinds of uh, things for operating, but also if building new lines, new uh, ways of creating acceptance uh, towards the people. So that area will, will change. If you go to the system side, for sure, there will be, I think, the biggest uh, um, uh, evolutions in how can we still uh, guarantee the safe operation, the, the security of supply, uh, not having any more the big power plants, but have a complete scattered landscape of all kinds of uh, devices uh, being connected by internet, which will respond on the, the signals we give as TSOs and DSOs, on one end from the TSO side for balancing and for congestion management, but also on DSO level, we, they, we have to give together in a combined way the signals, where do we see the, con the constraints and the market, the, 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 the customers together with his, all his suppliers will, will try to solve that. And that, is, and that should be in a such a way that those suppliers, those service providers can offer a good package to the customer uh, for, for yeah, depending on his profile and his needs. And that will be the big, the, the, the new setting in which TSOs yeah, will, will, will change from, from, from what we are today. David, as a provider into this market, how do you see it? Um, I support what Ben says. I think the assets are all important. I think they'll, they'll be there for a long time to come. I think we move into a world of information actually becomes really, really valuable, how you use the information. Um, there's a potential for TSOs to become an information broker, actually, because they are the one party in the electricity value chain that have the global picture of what's going on on the network. So they can collect information, do analytics, and actually optimize how the system runs. But I think that's having access to a number of different uh, resources. So it's not just about generation, it's about storage, it's about demand side, it's encompassing all the resources out there on the network. Okay, so we've talked, we've talked quite a bit about, I guess, the, how the, the future might look, how the future regulation might look. Um, do we think the, the market structure can evolve quickly enough or, or to, to cope with all of this change or do, do we need to, to totally rethink the way the, the way the market works. I mean, Ben mentioned earlier that, you know, perhaps regulation is trying to sort of solve the problems of the past. Is it difficult for the market model structure to keep up, do you think? Yeah, it's a, it will be a big challenge, and I, but I personally, I think that we will get some external uh, influences of, of, of companies who will jump one or the other way on our businesses and come up with new products which, which suddenly are smashing interesting for the customer. And then the things will uh, go extreme fast. And it will be from, I think, will be from outsiders and not from the in crowd uh, from the current setting. Okay. Mm. Okay. David? I think as, as the market involves and you see more peer-to-peer -peer trading, we, know we, we talked about um, you know, blockchain on an earlier panel, is how do you give visibility to the network operator of what's going on in the market? Um, you can't get away from the laws of physics at some point. You know, the market meets the laws of physics. You, you have to still maintain that visibility, that information flow. So yes, the market, I think, will reform. The market will change to, what, to where we are today from big centralized markets down to some more local trading but you've still got to engage you know, network, local network operators to make that happen. Okay. How do you feel about this, Mark, from the Commission's <coughs> point of view? Do you feel optimistic about what you've heard? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I also would think that the, uh, let's say, the business models of the future will be very, very different from what they are now. Uh, and it will come from, it may come from energy, uh, energy let's say the traditional energy suppliers, but uh, it may also come from uh, car companies, 
or uh, telcos, because I think the, um, let's say, once the digitalization of the grid starts, and one, once uh, and what, what, what Ben was talking about, uh, procuring uh, uh, ancillary services from electric cars or from charging points, for example, if uh, people start sniffing at that and that becomes possible, then I think that uh, there will be uh, uh, a whole new, um, new, new set of, of, of services coming up because uh, I think what's going to matter then is who has the ability to get the interest of the consumer. And uh, there are many, I think, there are many industries who are at least as good as that as the energy companies. And so I think they are all going to look into this business and say, hmm, we can make money here, we already know the customer, we just combine you know, what he searches on Google and what he posts on Facebook, and based on that we can make him an interesting offer on his energy consumption. I'm just saying, you know, but I think that it's going to come from very different angles. Okay. So we're coming a little bit towards the, the end of our time. Are there any, any burning questions in the audience that anyone would want to raise? Conscious of the fact that it's the last panel of the day? <laughs> well, perhaps if there aren't any questions from the floor, perhaps, perhaps I could just ask, ask each of the panel members just in, in conclusion to perhaps perhaps just summarize how, how they see the future um, for the energy sector in this, in this digital world. And, and I guess, you know, for the, for the TSO in particular, as, as, as that's what uh, the panel's been, been focused on. Who would like to start, David? Um, TSO in the digital world, I think it's about data collection, collecting the right information. It's not just about bulk transfer of everything you can collect. You've got to be selective what you collect, selective how you use it. I mean, it's easy to collect everything, but it's collecting the right bits of information. Um, but I think the TSO is pivotal to making this happen. I think without the TSO, uh, TSO engagement and driving some of the changes we need, um, it'll take a lot longer um, to get some of the reforms through. Okay, Ben? Uh, I think the TSO, what we, we strive for is that we, um, uh, First of all, uh, keeping on the lights, that is our duty, but, in the, but having that said and, and taking care of that, uh, we will really uh, try to serve the society and, and make these kind of things possible as, as by facilitate, facilitating uh, these kind of developments. And, and we, are, we can have a strong uh, uh, positive role in that and kickstart these kind of developments uh, by providing data and, and, and let the customer together with, with his suppliers uh, do the work at the end. Mm. I think obviously it, it's very difficult to make some uh, prediction on an industry which is probably one of the one of the industries that has the, the longest cycle, you know, like 80 years sometime on dams, for instance. But I, I'm still thinking that uh, given that uh, we have like two revolution at the same time, the, I would say, energy transition, global warming, and uh, digitalization. Uh, it creates uh, a type of window for complete disruption. And you know, my, 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 my guess is not whether TSO will stay in your future. They have extremely great infrastructure and we need it. My guess is we're gonna be the margin in the future. And I think to that extent, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to keep it. Because if you refer to the use of data, for instance, I've seen very little industries being able to use the data. If you think about the retailers, the music industry, uh, and many others, you know, they had the opportunity to, to start first. And they had the assets, they had the consumers. And they didn't do it. You know, once you have a player uh, that brings something which is uh, a new standard, it's very difficult for them to, 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 to be able to, to get in the race. Okay. Martin? Yeah, but, but maybe it's an opportunity if that change happens relatively late. So 
you can learn from what other industries failed, which also will depend on the sort of the space reg regulation leaves for TSOs to change their role. But that brings me back to the point I had before. Look at it from a perspective of opportunities, not of threats. Because only when you look at it as there are opportunities, and there are, uh, then you can really leverage these opportunities. And I think this is very important when I look at it from a TSO, but also from other players in the business. Uh, so don't be the, in German we say, the caniche, the rabbit in front of the snake, uh, but, but really act innovative. And, and what we need for that innovation, I think, is stepping back from I want to create new data silos to look at APIs and push APIs as a regulator and step away from the data ownership discussion because you won't succeed with data ownership. Usually it's too many people who have some right of ownership. Think about who has access to the data under which circumstances when and what does he have to do when he doesn't need it anymore, et cetera. So move to that and then we are back at the APIs. But there's an opportunity, use it and allow it to use this opportunity in the sort of the complex framework you have to look at. So we gave you the first word, Mark. You can have the last word as well. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I have much to add. I think uh, it's, uh, in, we're, we're on the right track. I'm, I, can, I find it hard to imagine a world without uh, TSOs that, uh, actually, or somebody who controls the frequency. Uh, I think we're still quite far away from that, and I think the, uh, the, the, the network operators have an essential role now in uh, making this new energy world and this new services world possible, and they can also be a big break. So I think the key issue is uh, speed and making sure that it goes fast. But if you look at the, uh, what Ben was saying, they were used to talk to a few power plants, now they may need to talk to uh, a few thousand electric cars. So th what they do, I don't think, is necessarily changing that much. It's just it's going to be a lot more, a lot more communication, a lot more ability to handle all that data and make something useful out of it and also feed that back. If, there, if the idea is going to be we have to sit on it and we have to be very selective, I think that then somebody else is going to do it for them and because there will, no, n there will be no shortage of data points either. Uh, people can start measuring everything everywhere uh, and say, if, if he doesn't do it, then I'm going to do it and I'm going to sell it. So I think that's, that's the, the, the key issue is the, is the speed, but I, uh, I would hope that, that the network operators uh, live up to that challenge. Okay, thank you, Mark. So if I could just perhaps ask you all to thank the panel in the normal way, and then I'll hand over to Calais uh, while we remain on the stage just to wrap up um, today. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, but uh, it's getting interesting only now. We, the dinner is waiting for us. Um, but, uh, but seriously, as well, I, I, I truly think it's now getting interesting. It seems that we all talk the same language. We, we understand the things in a similar way. Uh, we, from a learning side at least, we are eager for projects uh, uh, for really cross-border, cross-sector data exchange. Uh, we, are, we are here, we are ready for such projects. Uh, Cross-sector, I mean, why not combine data from energy with the data from telecom or data from car industry or whatever, and then putting these types of data together and making them available from, from uh, one single gate, uh, that would, that would uh, start to, to create conditions uh, for, for new services, new businesses. That would be really interesting. We want to do that. We are here. So uh, practical information. Uh, we have buses to dinner. Uh, they are there already uh, in uh, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so uh, quarter to seven, the buses are there already in front of the hotel. The final bus leaves uh, uh, seven o'clock sharp. So, so be there. Uh, the ones who want to take your own cars or, or taxis, for whatever reasons, um, the uh, access to the dinner site, it's an open air museum, but it's not from the main entrance, it's closed already, you just take roughly one kilometer further and then on the right side, the next gate is the entrance uh, to the museum. Um, 
Thank you uh, once again to all speakers, to, uh, to the audience. Uh, I think we all have gathered new ideas here. Um, and um, and uh, we, at least from Ellering's side, we have been uh, happy to host this conference uh, uh, as a kickoff of this Energy Week, uh, as, uh, as a part of Estonian EU presidency, uh, as just few months before our Republic, Republic of Estonia, will have uh, 100 years uh, of age. So uh, thank you once again. Uh, see you at dinner. Also, also those who you have not registered for dinner, I think there are seats available, so you, you are welcome. Thank you and see you next time.